Welcome everyone. This is the fifth class of the July 2023 IBIS Prep UBE Crash Course. Matt and I are wearing maroon. This is not a nod to Florida State University by any means, but it's just a happy color coordinate coincidence. And speaking of color coordinate coincidences, we are going to do civil procedure. And if I were to associate one color with civil procedure, it would probably be uh, gray. I would say gray. gray. You're gonna say gray too? I was gonna say gray. Yeah, I think gray is pretty much the color of coordination for civil procedure. But um, we'll do our best with it. And we have Matt in the building, the legend himself. And as you know, our process is to start by going over the questionnaires, which are not easy, um, but they are very helpful, very informative. And, you know, as I uh, bragged to the class, Matt did so well on the exam. And right after he finished, I said, hey, I want a questionnaire that's testing all the points that you had memorized. And here we are. So I would love for the class to participate. Um, you can speak right in the chat, whatever you want. Uh, Matt and I most know, Matt knows all these things. I know most of these things. Let's kind of reinforce what the class knows. So what is federal question jurisdiction? And you can, people can talk about like the elements or just what it is generally. I know you guys know this. Yeah, so people are saying in the chat, like federal law, getting it into federal court, uh, US law, treaty, constitution. Yeah, so federal courts, they can't hear any kind of case because there are just too many cases, the vast majority of cases are in state court. So Congress, and this goes back to con law, has limited like lower federal courts to original jurisdiction to hear certain cases. So they can only hear cases that arise under the federal question jurisdiction or uh, questions under diversity or supplemental jurisdiction. And federal question jurisdiction is the first kind. Yeah, they, yeah. yeah. as well people are saying in the chat. So um, it has to be that a federal right is being enforced essentially or not being enforced. And there has to be a federal question in the face of the complaint. You, so they love testing you, oh, there's a federal defense, can you remove it? No, it has to be a well pleaded complaint containing a federal question. And this goes back to Article 3. Y'all have me put in uh, parentheses, within parentheses, within parentheses, within parentheses. No, I don't know. All right, so we understand what uh, federal question jurisdiction is. We're getting to the federal court because it's raising something under federal law, which I think also besides bankruptcy, wouldn't we include admiralty maybe? Yeah, uh, probably IP patent. IP patent, yeah. These are federal I think questions. Must be like patent. They're going to ask you like, uh, federal statute, blah, blah, blah. And remember, it's in the claim, not a potential defense, right? If the defense yeah. raises a federal question, that's not enough to get it into federal court. It has to be something in the complaint, as we stated, in the face of the complaint. Excellent. I think we're jumping right into the grayness of this federal procedure. I'm already like, oh, yeah, here we go. Um, just to prove my point, I'm going to make this gray. It might be hard to see. Oh. Is it fair? You, you don't like that, Barbara? It's not good, gray. Red is better, all right, fine, fine. But you understand my point. All right, what is diversity jurisdiction? Can anyone explain that? You have to be from a different state. Yeah. Yeah, and then so, you have to be over a specific amount of money. How much money? I, I'm not sure, but I don't want to read the question. Somebody answered in the chat. Yeah, yeah, it has to be over 75,000. And why, do you know why it has to be over 75,000? It's kind of arbitrary. I guarantee no one knows but you, man. So right. It's because Congress said so. Oh, because Congress said so, yeah, I see. Tough answer, all right. Yeah, so over 75,000 and every plaintiff and every defendant must be diverse. Now, there's some difficulties about diversity, right? Yeah. Um, do you want to explain that, Matt? Yeah, so people sometimes ask, like, what does it mean that they all have to be diverse? It means, like, separate them on the V. Like, all the plaintiffs are on one side of the V. All the defendants on the other side of the V. The plaintiffs are from Iowa, Kansas, California. 
the defendants are from California, Missouri, Florida. Are they diverse? No, because just, just having one plaintiff and one defendant that are not diverse destroys diversity. And then you have like some exceptions with class actions where like it would be impossible to meet that. But normally you look at the V. Be careful with that statement. All right, so um, we talked about diversity here and what about uh, removal based on diversity? Who can remove? The D, yeah, the defendants, right? Only a defendant can remove for diversity. Yeah, they, they probably will test you and they'll, they'll make it very subtle, like, oh, the plaintiff's lawyer wants to remove, like they won't mention any, like, yeah. Very subtle. And wait, it gets harder, right? Aren't there situations where a defendant can't remove? There is. There is, right? What's up, Kitty? Um, there is, right? Okay, so Brian's saying it has to be within a year. Uh, I, think sure. might be, I think it has to be 30 days. I'll check. Okay. Um, but what about... Yeah, there is, there is like the forum state defendant exactly, rule. Exactly, the forum state defendant rule. Can anyone explain that? You can't remove to the federal court if it's within the same... Uh, state all like if you're a defendant of the same if you're a resident of the state like as a defendant and you're in state court you can't remove it to federal court correct yeah did i articulate that correctly a forum state defendant cannot remove solely based on diversity yeah and the idea there is that there's no reason for the defendant to remove because they're already getting the home state advantage mm -hmm. this the right here one of diversity that. jurisdiction is so like no plaint no defendant removal like feels like they might be, you know, in a hostile state or whatever. So let's think about a scenario. A, so oh, it's 30 days. A, oh, it's 30 days, right? That's what I thought. Yeah. Brian trying to lead us astray here. No, I'm just messing with you. you guys are welcome to contribute. Me and Matt both looked at each other. Like, I'm, that's why I love having you here because I might have accepted that it's true. All right. 30 days to remove. Now let's think about this. A sues B. A is from Florida. B is from Georgia. And they sue it in state court in Georgia. A sues B, B is from Georgia, it's state court in Georgia, right? Now, D or B says, hmm, wait a minute, we're diverse. A is from Florida, I'm B, I'm from Georgia. The amount of controversy is $90,000, everything is good. Let's remove it, let's go up to federal court, right? So we're gonna move to federal court in Georgia. That's fair, right? I'm a defendant, I'm choosing to remove from uh, Georgia to the federal court in Georgia, right? Based solely on diversity. That's cool, right? No, that's not cool. That's what I'm trying to enforce right here. It's not cool because I, in that situation, would be a forum state defendant, right? And what Matt was saying is like, well, can you actually articulate that better than me about why the real reason is? That yeah. So, I mean, I feel like it's not as much of a big deal now, but back then, you know, 1800s, there was a lot more hostility between states than there is now, or maybe there is now today. But you might think like, oh, these judges in this one state might be prejudiced against me because of, I'm from a different state especially if the plaintiff might be from that state. Right, exactly. So if you're suing someone in uh, state court and it's solely based on diversity, then there's no reason to move it up to federal court because it's already being dealt with in your state. Yeah. They don't need to move it any higher, right? There's no, it doesn't really change anything. You're not going to get like prejudiced against because you're from a different state. Exactly. that's like the reason to remove because you feel like you'd be prejudiced let's do this on a federal level but here it's like there's no change you're going from the same state to the same state you're only sitting in diversity now if there's a federal question presented and you're a form state defendant then of course you can remove right okay. i'm saying of course like it's super obvious but then yes you can remove right okay i i recognize how difficult this is for everyone because it was very difficult for me too and um, does anyone know how you how you can like how is 75,000 calculated. How do they reach that? With a calculator? No. So it's like pretty, they just kind of trust the plaintiff's good faith, really. Like they're not gonna like, it's not strictly scrutinized. It's a good play fleeting, right. If you believe it's gonna be 76,000 yeah. damages, it turns out to only be $50,000 in damages, it would still satisfy diversity because you pled in good faith, believing that it was gonna be $75,000 in damages. Well, it can get tricky when you have multiple defendants and multiple plaintiffs, of course, as everything does get tricky in Cipro. We're gonna are we gonna do an aggregation of claims on these questions? 
I think we will. If not, just let's kind of touch on that. I don't want to kill everyone right now. Yeah, but... yeah, it might be too much. It's not really. It's not. No, let's let's talk about it. Okay. Let's talk about it briefly. Briefly, go ahead, Matt. So, if you have two plaintiffs and they're suing the same defendant, and one plaintiff for the same, you know, act, same car accident, one is suing the defendant for forty thousand, the other is suing the defendant for also forty thousand, but separately, that adds up to eighty thousand. So, on their own. That wouldn't reach seventy-five thousand, the amount in controversy requirement. But together, they do reach that, so that's fine. But if it's two plaintiffs suing two defendants, okay, hold on, slow down, so I can just get this right. So if you have two plaintiffs suing the same defendant, both of forty k, that single defendant can aggregate the claims to reach diversity because it's two plaintiffs versus a single defendant. Right? Uh, yeah. Um. Okay. Uh. Well. What's the best thing? Um, I actually don't think it doesn't. It might not even have to be the same claim or controversy, but it has to be the same claim or controversy if you're suing multiple defendants. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what were you? What were the confusing. I'm uh, not that it wasn't confusing. What was the second statement you're going to state about? So if you have two plans that sue the same defendant, that defendant can aggregate. But as you're saying, um, if you're suing two defendants. If two plaintiffs are suing two defendants, you know they're each suing them for forty thousand. That you can't aggregate them unless the plaintiffs are jointly and severably liable, which is a concept in torts. And that's when, like, they're both liable for the accident, or not. It doesn't have to be a car accident, but that's a common example. Claims to reach the amount, unless. Um, they... All, like, the real takeaway is that if there's multiple defendants and like it's a amount of controversy is, issue, like just be wary of what the question is saying. Be wary of aggregation. This isn't something that you have to necessarily memorize. Just like just right. note that if you see something like this, like there's more to it, and like you can probably get the rest of it from like the fact pattern. Thank you. Fair enough. If there's multiple defendants, be wary of aggregation. But if it's a single defendant, he or she can likely aggregate. Like the bar exam is like, I think it's an inch deep, but a mile wide. Yeah. You don't have to know anything like super in depth. It helps, but you don't have to. You just have to know like a broad amount of everything. Yeah. I got so many jokes in my head today, but I'm going to keep them at, at bay. All right. Let's talk about supplemental jurisdiction. What do we got for that? Anyone in the class? So not, not an easy concept if you were hoping for an easy concept. It's not. Someone mentioned same transaction occurrence. I feel like it's definitely going to come into play here. Common nucleus of operative fact, yes. When yeah. you can add jurisdictions. Okay. How would, how would you define it for us, Matt? Yeah, I mean, I would say like the phrase common nucleus of operative fact, like that's tattoo that on your forehead. Like just know same transaction or occurrence or same series of transactions or occurrences. So pretty much same transactions or occurrences. And what does that, what does that mean? It means that if you have a claim that cannot reach a federal court because one, it's not a federal question. So, it's, so you can only have supplemental jurisdiction over state claims. That's the only time that it matters. But if that state claim that independently can't reach the federal courts is out of the same common nucleus or same transaction, same occurrence as a claim that does reach it, then the federal court can hear it. So if you have a car accident and the plaintiff sues the defendant using some federal statute that I can't think of an example, but some federal statute that would meet federal question jurisdiction, and they're also suing them for tort, which is always state law. If they're suing them for 50,000, that would not reach the amount of controversy, but because it's part of the same accident as the federal claim, let's say um, the defendant didn't have an airbag and that's a federal law, I don't know. Like that would reach the federal courts supplementally. That by itself satisfies the requirements. All right, am I, am I off here? So federal court can hear a claim that would not on its own meet federal question jurisdiction or diversity, but because it is part of the same transaction or occurrence as another claim that by itself satisfies requirements, the court may exercise 
supplemental jurisdiction and hear the claim? Yeah. Not easy at all. Not easy concept at all. I know we're shaking our heads, but it's very difficult because you're like, oh, this won't this won't make it into federal court because it's only twenty five thousand dollars. But if it's the same transaction as occurrence as another claim that independently gets into federal court, then the court may exercise supplemental jurisdiction. If I'm correct on it, it's may, right? The court isn't required to. What'd you say? Optional. It's optional, yeah. They may. So again, uh, I hope everyone comes to my Sunday MBE classes. So Matt, I hope you come to that one too. So we can do some pro questions together and, and see how this really plays out. And then also, honestly, even if you're just taking the MBE, it wouldn't be a bad thing to stick around for the end of this class and see you know, some of these uh, uh, concepts into play on essays because it's the same federal law. All right, when can a court deny supplemental jurisdiction? Is there ever a time where a federal court must allow supplemental jurisdiction? Is optional, right? Yeah. Is so there any so it, it never ha there's never a must. I could be wrong, but I, I don't think so. All right, it's optional. Cool. But I mean, also, like the big thing is that if the supplemental claim destroys diversity and it's supplemented to a diversity jurisdiction claim, then that's not okay. Okay. So and that, that would have to involve a supplemental claim involving another party generally bringing in another person that would destroy diversity. Okay, so if supplemental uh, claim will destroy diversity and original claim is only in federal court via diversity, court cannot exercise? Yeah, and I know this is very confusing. What I did is I would, I wrote things out in pencil and pen on paper, like not just like not even typing it. I think that's the way like people understand things best is by writing it out on pen because that's much slower and much more annoying because we never use pens anymore. So it really makes you think about what you're writing. Yeah, I like that, man. Good stuff. So this is all very, very hard, extremely hard. I didn't know this questionnaire would start off so hard, but I like that. But like also- there are like factors for when, for like why the court doesn't have supplemental jurisdiction. That's generally like when it's a very complex issue of state law and they want to leave it to the state. Um, the federal court just is like, honestly, like it's too busy and they have too much stuff going on. And like, like their docket is too full. They don't want to take it from them. Um, the court dismissed so let's say you have supplemental jurisdiction on a diversity case or a federal question jurisdiction case. And then the federal claim or the, or the independent claim is dismissed and the supplemental claim is still there in federal court. They can dismiss that, but they don't have to, which might oh. be talking about more. No, I, I want to touch on that because I've seen that annoying and difficult question, right? So then if the, the claim that's not in the dependent claim, the supplemental claim, like is much more predominant. Like let's say you have a $30,000 federal claim against someone and then a $500 million claim that's supplemental but wouldn't reach it because it's not diverse. Like that, they would probably not bring that in when it's so much more predominant than the actual independent claim. So think about like if, you have, if you're tested on this, which is possible, it's not guaranteed. Like what is the independent claim? What is the dependent claim, the supplemental claim? And like, what is like the relationship between them? Like, is this like a very unique case or is it just like tort? Like if it's just a common tort question, then like they're probably not gonna deny it. But if it's like, would involve, you know, the meaning of state power and could destroy state sovereignty, they probably wouldn't take it. All right. Well, we are locked into this civil procedure. Does anyone have questions? Because I'm sure that there are probably yeah. some questions. Any questions? Or if you're just saying like you don't understand. Well, I think to be fair, a lot of people are confused because it's difficult, but they understand. Yeah, yeah the it's confusing in jurisdictions like probably the most commonly tested CIPRO topic. It is the most commonly tested CIPRO topic. So it's to like go over in more depth than 
appeals, which is just not tested as much. Yeah, I feel we know federal question jurisdictions as we're getting in from some constitutional or federal thing. Um, we know diversity jurisdiction, that's when $75,000 and everyone's diverse. And of course, the not of course, but the form state defendant cannot remove based solely on diversity. Um, we talked about aggregation of claims where you can aggregate if it's a single defendant, but it's more difficult if it's two defendants. Um, we talked about supplemental jurisdiction, different than aggregation because aggregation is trying to raise to meet the dollar amount. Supplemental jurisdiction is actually adding on another claim uh, that wouldn't in itself meet the requirements of federal jurisdiction. And uh, you need the common nucleus of operative fact. Yeah. That's the key thing. And then touching back on- So if you just- or, what? Like you can have a case where you have supplemental jurisdiction over a claim because it's from the same common nucleus as a federal question claim. The federal question claim is dismissed and the court then can optionally dismiss the supplemental claim because it's no longer like no longer there on its own basis, but it doesn't have to. It can keep hearing the supp supplemental claim even though it dismissed the case that helped bring it to federal court in the first place. Exactly. And I, I wrote that right down here. That but like They definitely can have a question where, you know, it'll be, you know, the thing I just said, the federal claim is dismissed. Must the court then dismiss the supplemental claim? No. It's May. Exactly. Plus versus May is just very important, just like throughout the bar. Know the difference, like when it's used, must, it must, may, they don't have to, but they can. It, it comes up everywhere. For sure. <clears throat> must versus May. I must continue to the next question. All right. When a federal court claim hears state law claims, when can a federal court hear state law claims? When can a state court hear federal law claims? Um, when can a federal court hear state law claims? If it's uh, intertwined, is that what we're going for? I mean, I mean like, just like what we were talking about before, like if, it's, if there's diversity or cell phone jurisdiction. Oh, sure. Yeah. And when can a state court hear federal law claim? Always. Always? Yeah. Always. They can, state courts can hear anything. State courts can hear anything. Even bankruptcy? Um, no, okay. So, so they can hear almost anything. That's a good point. They can hear almost anything except for certain areas that federal courts have blocked out for federal courts, like anything to do with like veterans, federal tax, um, international trade, uh, bankruptcy, admiralty, but like 90, 95, 98% of all cases, state courts can hear. But that's, that's a good point, Brayden. Well, my question, and you know, I have questions. So if you are uh, in state court and it raises a federal issue, right? A federal question is presented, must it be removed to federal court? Yeah. Or can a state court hear it? Even if yeah. there's a federal question presented. Yes. Yes to what? Oh, they can, state courts can hear anything. You don't have to bring a federal question to federal court. Okay. You can, but you don't have, like, state Supreme Courts, like, hear First Amendment cases all the time. Sure. All right. I think I know this one. So this makes me feel more confident. What are the rules for diversity for a class action suit? Anyone in the class have any ideas? This is also like very arbitrary. Okay, then what is it? Um, so minimal diversity is required if any member of the plaintiff class is a citizen of a state different from any defendant. Um, also, isn't it important the representative, right, of the class? I think the representative, I don't know offhand, I would think, I think the representative, Probably, I'm, I'm not, I don't think, I'll, I'll look that up. Whatever, yeah, from my understanding, when it's a class action, you have the person who represents the suit, whatever states he's from, that's what, what stands for diversity. I think that also has implications of minimal diversity. Yeah, and then the amount in controversy is 5 million, which is arbitrary. The amount in controversy is 5 million. Because like class action suits are a pain in the ass. Like they don't want to hear it unless they absolutely like have to. Yeah. All right. Well, while you go to that more difficult number six question, I think the class and I can jump to these ones, which are uh, pretty much easier. But yeah. So, I, I, I'm, I'm, go ahead. 
excuse me, Andrew, I think, um, are you sure that's supposed to be from every defendant, the, the representative from every defendant? No, well, I'm not sure. There's only one. So the defendants probably don't have a, like, aren't going to have a representative, but like, only the classes have representatives. So was that right? Um, what did you write? Yeah, he put defendant. I'm just double checking if it's. I don't. I don't see. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I think. Okay. Yeah, no, that's what I said. Let Matt look that up, and in the meantime, we'll go on. We'll move to seven. So, how is a person's place of domicile determined? We could do this one, right? So, okay, you need minimal diversity overall and complete diversity for class reps. Class uh -huh. reps are like two people out of like a thousand. So, yeah. Exactly. So I am right. So minimal diversity overall, and then. The representative class is different from a defendant, which is complete diversity. So yeah, complete diversity for the representative, minimal diversity overall. Yeah. All right. Probably won't come up, if, which makes you feel better. All right. How is a person's place of domicile determined? This definitely comes up. Yeah, this is one of the most fun parts of CIPRA. There we go, Paul. Uh, home state where they intend to remain. Oh, that's so there's like a subjective component and an objective component. There's subject like it's a place where they live, where they reside, and where they intend to reside indefinitely. Like so, if you're at college, you're you're at you know FSU for four years, but you're from Georgia, and like you don't plan to live in Florida after college, then your your domicile is Georgia, even if you live in Florida for four years. So lots of college students like their domicile just defaults to where they were born because they've never lived anywhere other state and like their college is not their domicile. But if you have this subjective intent to reside there indefinitely and you can prove it somehow, then that place would be your domicile. Interesting. Okay. Can a person be a citizen of more than one state and a corporation or business entity be a citizen of more than one state? Ooh, I love corporation business entity questions. I can answer that one. What about people? My least favorite. Uh, no, they can't. No, of course not. People can only be domiciled in one state, but I have a feeling that you obviously have people like, especially in Florida, who live there six months of the year. They still look at like, okay, are you there for six months in a day? Yes, we call them snowbirds. Yeah, snowbird. Yeah, my grandparents. Your grandparents? Yeah, I'm a, I'm an aspiring snowbird. I just gotta get my winter place. Okay. Um. Or no, my summer place. I have my winter place. I need my summer place, but it's hot outside, as you were mentioning. So corporations, I know that they're uh, more than one. Where are corporations domiciled? Um, where they're incorporated, and then... Um, you could say, keep on. I don't remember the other one. Where they're incorporated, and... Written, it, written that way, but yes, principal place of business. Place of business, also known as their nerve center. Yeah, and nerve center is kind of like their brain, where the brain is. Yeah. So like they will they will like to put like, oh, like their head office is in Iowa, but their major factory where they produce everything is in Indiana. Their nerve center would be in Iowa. Right. So Matt works for Iowa's prep uh, in DC, but the nerve center is Miami, Florida, right? So you couldn't, uh, we're not domiciled in DC just because we do UB tutoring there, right? We're domiciled where we're incorporated, which is Florida, and where our nerve center is, which is Miami, Florida. So we are only domiciled in one state. Most businesses, and maybe I'll do this in the future, are actually incorporated in Delaware. Delaware. Yeah. That is big too now, increasingly. But yeah, Delaware. So I mean, they usually say like state A, state B, but yeah, Delaware is usually where places are incorporated, which just means. Kinda, you kind of jumped off. What's the other state you said is, is popping off? That is really going for that. What is it? Nevada. Nevada, Nevada yeah, Nevada. Cool. How is the amount of controversy calculated? We said good faith. Um, I do have that. Okay, yes. <clears throat> oh, we did a lot of this. When can a defendant remove a case from state to federal court? And when can a plaintiff? Okay, I want to hear from the students. All right. Let's hear from them. I think a plaintiff can never. Yeah. Remove it's a case. If the plaintiff wants to bring the case in federal court, like they should do that in the complaint, removal is only for defendants. Right, a plaintiff cannot remove. I can't tell you how many times people get that question wrong because they just slip it in there, right? Like if the plaintiff changes their mind and they're like, why did I do this in state court? They can 
Um, they can dismiss their own case. They can, you know, they can stop and then they can they can file a complaint again, but they can't remove. Sitting in diversity? Yeah. Sit for my favorite subject. But no, this is really like, I swear this question is like, they give you a huge fact pattern and then they're like, and then the plaintiff removes and you're just like, oh shoot, the plaintiff can't remove, right? Or the forum state defendant removes sitting in diversity. These are two people who can't remove. Okay, uh, abstention really is not very important, but we okay. can we can briefly talk about it. Wait, are we going to abstain from doing this question? We we could abstain if everyone votes that, but I this just means that like federal courts can say no. Tell us already. So federal courts can say no to hearing certain cases, and there's different kinds of abstention. Um, the main one is like when, like some like, like the exact proceeding is going on in state court, and that involves like a lot of like criminal stuff. Like if someone is being tried for a crime at the state level and he might ap appeal to the federal level saying, oh, my rights are being violated, the federal court will say, I'm not gonna do anything until the state proceeding is over. Or uh, if it's like a very unsettled area of state law and the federal court believes that the state needs to like get this to the state Supreme Court to like figure out what's going on, they're not, they're gonna abstain. We don't have to talk about this, it's pretty- I got it. The main type of wants the state to figure things out first. All right, what is the significance of Penoyer v. Neff? It was the first case we have I read in my law school. I assume it's the same for everyone in Cipro. All right. What what uh if it really established like what personal jurisdiction is and like how you get it? Because you didn't really have any of these issues until the 14th Amendment was passed. And that's I don't have to talk about that because that will take for too long. But um, yeah, so the main things are consent, uh, tagging, and there's like a better word for tagging, but that's what I remember, and then domicile. All right, talk to me. What, what does this mean? Anything and else? When you consent to personal jurisdiction, that's pretty easy. Plaintiffs always consent, otherwise they wouldn't be plaintiffs. Um, tagging is like when they're in the state and you physically serve them papers and you're saying like, here, you're being served. If they're in that state, then you can have personal jurisdiction over them. And then domicile is if they live there. So if they're domiciled there. I was today years old when I think I realized that the reason they call it tagging is because like tag you're it and they like hit you with the Yeah, I think that yeah, that's that's what I've always thought. I just thought that. Yeah, like tag you're it, like you're in the state, I tagged you, gotcha. That might be wrong, but I think that oh, no, I think that's it too. Oh, all right, for me. If it's not, that's a good way to think of it. Yeah, it's a good way to think about it. All right. What happens if a state has a long arm statute? And what happens if it has if it doesn't happen if it's a T-Rex statute? Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure they all have it, but they could throw in a question where they say state X does not have a long arm statute. So long arm statutes just mean that like states can have personal jurisdiction up to anything that doesn't violate the 14th Amendment due process. And like that goes into questions of minimum contacts, which are later on. Yeah. Um, they don't have long arm statutes. Uh, it, they might need more to um, have personal jurisdiction, but that would kind of depend on like the state. That Like I can't really say anything without like a fact pattern on that. But they're almost always like every question is basically going to say like assume the state has a long arm statute. Right, you always assume they have a long arm statute. Isn't true? There could be general or specific. Oh, haha. sixteen question. All right, look at me ahead of myself. Is having a long arm statute enough to have personal jurisdiction over defendant? No, they need minimal contacts, right? Yeah, you still need to like meet the Fourteenth Amendment. And meet the Fourteenth Amendment. So yeah, you have general jurisdiction, specific jurisdiction, and this is also like super important, super heavily tested. So what's the difference between general and specific jurisdiction? Does anyone want to take a stab at this? I think general is the one where you have systematic, continuous, and substantial contacts with the forum state. And then specific jurisdiction is when your contacts to the state are related to the lawsuit. Excellent. Exactly. When your contact, 
when the lawsuit arises. Yes. Arises in federal context. So for instance, if you're driving through Georgia and you get in a car accident, they would have specific jurisdiction over you because you were driving through the state, right? Yeah, only if they're suing you about the car accident, not if they're suing you about something Anything else, right? Because you don't have general jurisdiction. Um, we, when we talk about minimum contacts, I kind of wanted to find that because there's a big word, there's some words there, right? Does anyone know what words are associated with minimum contacts? I have three in mind. Yeah, purposeful Perfect. availment. There we go. Purposeful availment. Ooh, that's got to be someone's rap album. That's such a hot name. Is it privileges and immunities too, or is that one? One of the rap albums or one of the minimum contacts? <laughs> it's not one of the minimum contacts, but it is a pretty good rap album for sure. Um, yeah. Uh, doesn't offend the notions of the fair play and substantial justice. I like that. Doesn't offend the notions of fair play and justice. Mm -hmm. And then relatedness, right? Or um, for security? I think only for specific, but yeah. Yeah, okay, wait. Relatedness is for. And, it's all jumbled together, though. Yeah. And foreseeability comes in here somewhere, right? Yeah. Like is like is there contacts with the state something that could foresee being sued in the state? Exactly. Okay. And again, even if this is not perfect, we're just talking about this. We're going to look into the uh, the essays after this um, after this questionnaire, and then we'll be doing MBE questions not next week, which is real property, but the following week, civil procedure. I switched it up so we do these factors sooner. Oh, here, this is what I'm talking about. What are the factors that the courts use in determining that there would be fair play and substantial justice in defendant being sued in that state? The Asahi factors. That's not a car, right? Uh, I think so. Why yeah. is it? Why is it? I think it's a accident, but yeah, same, yes. Why is fair play and substantial justice a requirement in the first place? So is, is this kind of what I was talking about up here? Um, purposeful availment and all this stuff? Yeah. The acai factors. Acai factors. And this goes back to like due process. Like, it would it be fair to sue this person in this state? Like, would they be getting fair process by being sued for whatever thing is going on in this forum? Here we go. The five factor test. Um, right here. The burn is severe. Uh, oh wait. This looks like it was made in the eighties. Yeah. Judicial, oh, okay, it's a burden on the defendant, um, interests of the state, forum state, interests of the plaintiff. Um, yeah, if it's reasonable to be held into court, basically. Yeah. The, the traditional notions of fair play and justice would permit personal jurisdiction. All right, we kind of understand personal jurisdiction. Can a court ever not have personal jurisdiction on a plaintiff? I feel like yes. Yeah, I didn't really like have an answer to this. I would assume uh, no, just because plaintiffs always consent. Oh, over a plaintiff, yeah. not really, because by definition, the plaintiff's consenting to the jurisdiction of where they're suing. Consenting by suing in that jurisdiction. But obviously, like there are lots of times where they don't have subject matter jurisdiction. I, could, I misread that. I was saying over defendant. I was like, yeah, they don't have personal jurisdiction. <laughs> yeah. All right, so questions one through 16, I will agree with Matt. I think that's the hardest part of civil procedure. Yeah, so it's also like, this is like, most of pro questions will be on this, like these. If, did we lose everyone? Is anyone still there? Maybe we should have done this question differently because that was tough. But the, he, he's right. This is what's tested often and you got to know it and it's not easy. And today was just our first swipe at it. You know, we'll, we'll make sure you're studying it, going back on it. Um, Matt and I might even do another video or something. We have videos in the lecture series, but we definitely want to make sure that people feel confident yeah. in, in these parts. Like right. if you don't understand, you know, sanctions, that's fine going to the test, but you need to understand this. God, God's too. All right. Speaking of things we got to understand, service and notice. What rules in the FRCP cover process and service of process? Okay, that, that's not really that important in hindsight. But it's important. LB Four and five? Um, uh, yeah, I think, I'm not sure about five, but definitely four. Maybe three and four? 
I'm going with 12B4 and 5. Oh, yeah. That's like dismissing for lack of service, but like rule oh. four, like cover service. Sorry. And it's definitely worth reading just because like there's so many things to it. And like just reading like what they say is the most important thing and knowing like what the law is because they're the ones who wrote it, the Congress. Right. But I just remember because my professor in law school was very serious about 12B. Okay. What is, who is eligible to be a process server? This is, this is definitely the most fun question. Anyone over 18. Yeah. And also not a party. So the plaintiff can never serve the defendant. That's why like in TV shows, if you see, it's always some random person who like doesn't have any lines besides you're being served. Um, Seth Rogen in Pineapple Express. Wait, what, he, That's he was what he was a server? Or yeah. he, was, he was dodging one. No, he, that was his job. He was a process I a long time. Never Wait, seen that. No, I, I, I saw it a long time ago. That was what he did. He would serve. Oh, um, okay, now, now I remember. And he had to serve some guy and like he witnessed a crime. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I was, yeah. I was out of the movie, exactly. He was a process server. And all he was was some dude over 18, right? He was definitely yeah. not qualified in any other manner. All right. He was dating a girl who was in high school, remember? Right, yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. How can the method of process comport with due process? Does it change depending on who the defendant is? This is a Matt Beckerman question. We need a Matt Beckerman answer. Here. Honestly, I'm not even sure what I meant by writing this. Um, it, oh, yeah. It has to be a way that, like, the defendant will understand. So if you're, like, if you physically can't reach the person, you can also post it in the news, like, online, um, reach them, like, electronically. But you can't just like, like if they live in Florida, you can't put it in the Boston Globe. Like you'd have to put it in Florida papers and you'd have to put it like, you, it has to be done in a way that they can like reasonably expect it to see it or get it. Right. You have to put it in the newspaper for like two weeks or something? Yeah, for at least two weeks at work. Uh, Papa, what do you mean by that? Can you serve someone at work? Um, I believe so if like you can't reach them at their home yeah you could definitely get served at work yeah i've, I've definitely seen it in tv yeah that's what I, I was just going with i was just going with yeah i've seen people in tv get served at work Shaq got served i thought Shaq was the mayor how are you gonna serve him isn't he immune why are report dates where are report dates regarding service christmas yeah and okay it has to be reasonably calculated to make the parties aware of the action and give them enough opportunity and time to object is the exact language. Reasonably calculated to make them aware of the, I'm sorry, what did you say? Must be reasonably calculated to make them aware of the process? Of, yeah, of the action and to give them, and like what the action is and to give them time to object and opportunity. And Nicole's saying that a friend of mine's law firm served Shaq. Is that is you're talking about Shaq? What did he do? Is this recent? Yeah, what did Shaq do? Dominate the league for 20 years? That's a crime? <laughs> oh, served at the game. Um, what are the important dates? Yeah, I think I saw that too. Someone got like served with a divorce at a game or something. I don't know. Maybe not. What are the important dates regarding service? I want to say 90 days. Yeah, right? Yeah. Well, I think um, it's you get 90 days, 90 days to serve them. And then they have what I believe, I'll, I can, I should need to look this up. I think it's either 30 days to respond unless they consent to not having, to not needing like a physical cert process server, which by the vast majority of people just consent to not needing that. Then they get 60 days to respond or 90 if it's a foreign defendant. But I because the rules are slightly different when you're, different, when you're serving someone in a different country. And yeah, you can verify that. I mean, those dates seem important. Maybe they don't seem right. Is that what you meant, waiver of service? Like if they say you could serve me? Waiver. Okay, so give the defendant a reasonable time of at least 30 days after the request was sent, or at least 60 days if sent to a defendant outside of the US to return the waiver. A defendant who, before being served with process, timely returns a waiver need not serve an answer to the complainant until 60 days after the request was sent 
if they waive to physical process or 90 days if they're outside the US. 60 days if waiver of physical process, 90 days if waiver outside US. All of this is in rule four, which I think definitely like worth going through, at least parts of it. Rule four? Yeah, I put that in the chat. Cool. Oh, rule four. Well, you can't just put things in the chat. We got to look at them. Rule four about summons. Okay, cool. Contents that someone has to name the court and the parties, be directed to the defendant, state the name and address of the plaintiff's attorney or if unrepresented plaintiff, state the time within which the defendant must appear and defend, notify the defendant that failure to appear and defend will result in a default judgment against the defendant for the relief demanding the complaint, be signed by the clerk, bear the court's seal. Service in general, a summons must be served with a copy of the complaint. The complaint is responsible for having summons and complaints served within the time allowed and must furnish necessary copies. Any person over 18 or by a marshal. Yeah, and then E is serving someone within the US, F is serving someone outside the US. But yeah, a lot of these are like just give you like exactly what the law is. And this is what is tested. Like it tells you exactly like who can be a process server, how many days people get. Like this is like the best source for understanding the law. And then you obviously use supplemental sources to then understand what the hell this is talking about. So 30 days after request, 60 days after outside the country, or waiver of service, 60 days after a request, 90 days after out of the country. Does everyone understand waiver? Can you explain it to us? Yeah, so you're waiving like the physical process. You're saying it's okay, you don't need some random individual to come serve you. And that's good because it's a lot more efficient to not have that, you know, for the hundreds of thousands of cases that are filed every year. And if you refuse to waive, from what I understand, you have to pay for the cost of the process server. So it really incentivizes you to waive. Cool, that wasn't so bad. All right, venue. Venue, venue, venue. When is venue proper? Who is a good question for the class? Well, first, what is venue? That, is also, that also kind of answers when it's proper. Um, not really, but potentially. The residence of the defendant where the transaction occurred, right? So venue is the actual location, right? Yeah. And it's proper where the cause of action occurred or where any of the defendants reside. Um, yeah, I think if... I think that's only if they're all from the same state. Let me check that. Yeah, it's all if, it's that's only if they're all from the same state. And then if neither of those apply, which often happens, and you're going to be tested on circumstances when neither of those apply, it's anywhere where there's personal jurisdiction over the defendant. For example, like if the action occurs in a foreign country, then neither then a then neither of those will apply because every suit that we're talking about on the bar is in the u.s i think it's amazing how i can type without looking at my fingers <laughs> i know that's something natural that we could all do but it's like how is this even happening i'm just i want to be one of those people that works in a court you know like all right Describe the different steps you would take if venue isn't proper and if venue is proper, but you believe the case would be better litigated somewhere else. So we want to transfer venue, right? Yeah. So you would file a motion to transfer venue? Yeah. Well, if venue is, oh, this is the only one venue is proper. Yes. Um, yeah, you file a motion to transfer venue. If venue is improper, and a venue is proper, but you leave it to be better to litigate elsewhere. So file to transfer venue to a proper venue. And then if it's proper, but you believe would be litigated somewhere else, right? There's a- That's generally because like, oh, the witnesses are there, they don't have to travel, yeah. the evidence is there. So um, how would you do that? Uh, you just, I think there's just like a motion to transfer venue. Yeah, same thing, right? And if it's improper, I think you can either you can do a motion to transfer, or you could just dismiss the case and file it again somewhere else. Dismiss, right? And here it's just about that makes sense. I guess you can dismiss a proper venue case too, but it's easier to just do the motion. And explain why. 
which is like all the um, witnesses are there. Why it's better to not dismiss? No, I'm just saying why I was going to ask you a oh, yeah. dream thing and explain it's because all the witnesses are there. That's a, a reason. Like file the motion to transfer, even though venue's proper here, we're filing a motion saying, hey, we should transfer to a different venue, even though this venue's proper, because for instance, all the witnesses are there. Even though Hawaii is proper, everyone lives in Tennessee, so it would make more sense to do it there. All right, we got a lot of work to do, my man. We're gonna have to move at a, at a more rapid pace. So what is form nine convenes and what is its purpose? It just means that um, inconvenience, yeah. Forum. Yeah, it's a Latin for inconvenient forum, which they I feel like they get to use English at this point, but especially for this. Um, okay, what is the form selection clause? There is proper venue, but like another venue is just so more obviously more suited for the case. And don't we try to like prevent forum shopping? Um, heard of that before, that term before. Yeah, forum shopping is when you like choose the venue based on like where you think the judge or jury would be better for your case. There's not really a way to, or it's allowed, it's just kind of frowned upon. Okay, and then what is a, what is pendant venue? Um, pendant venue is I think when I think it's when you don't have either like the defendants residing in the same state, if they're all from the same state or the transaction occurred in that venue, then you just have venue wherever the court has personal jurisdiction. And the venue, I never heard of this. But, so it's just like what we talked about before. Okay. Oh, wait, that's not what it is. Okay. Pendant venue is the principle that once venue is established, you don't need to show venue for counterclaims, cross claims, anything else. You just like everything has venue once you have venue in the first instance. Because having to prove venue every once really make everything much slower. All right, cool. Yeah, so I hope everyone is strapped in because the next 45 minutes are gonna be Quite a ride. All right. What yeah, is the eerie property? Are there any questions? Just because, like, when you have jurisdiction, venue is a huge chunk of the exam. I know I've said that a bunch of times, but it's still true. Uh -huh. Eerie is not as much, is not nearly tested as much as venue is or jurisdiction is. Still, it's tested. So let's go with eerie. Can anyone out there define eerie doctrine for me? Right. Federal law should apply the state's law not where the transaction occurred but where the where they're sitting right yeah with a depending on the forum state um so paul just to make sure that you understand that it's not necessarily where the transaction occurred it's where they're sitting right like in diversity right so, yeah only for diversity cases, you're never going to have an eerie issue for federal. Diversity, federal court should apply the state court or the forum state. Meaning, so A and B, A is from Florida versus B from Georgia, right? And the accident occurred in Georgia, but the action was filed in Florida and removed the federal court, right? Yeah. We would apply Florida state law here. Does that make sense? Even though the cause, yeah. Even, even though the cause of action occurred in Georgia, it's where the, the uh, state court is sitting in diversity. We're going to apply that law. The reason Erie hates Erie is because it makes this distinction between substantive and procedural law that doesn't really like, that's not really always clear. Like what is procedural and what is substantive? There's not really a definition. Procedural substantive are things that affect rights and procedural are not. But so when you have a federal question jurisdiction case, you apply federal procedural and federal substantive law. That's easy. That's obvious. And I guess not obvious, but like it's clear. And then when you have a diversity case, you apply federal procedural law, but state substantive law of wherever, whatever forum state 
the federal court is sitting in. Right. Procedural is like rules, and then substantive is like the like damages, for example. Yeah. Um, That's affecting like your rights, how much you owe. So if Florida says you know fifty thousand dollars for his injury, Georgia law says forty thousand. Federal law says twenty thousand. You would apply Florida. All right. I just want you to quickly answer this question for me. What are small specific areas where there's a federal common law? Yeah, so we kind of talked about them a lot. Uh, bankruptcy, admiralty, uh, federal tax, trade, international trade. I mean, um, then you have just kind of random other areas like government contractors, uh, healthcare devices. Cool. Um, all right, this, especially for taking the MB, which is pretty much everyone in here except for like maybe one person. Um, this thing is hard right here. What are some examples of what's procedural and what are some examples of what's substantive? You gave us damages for substantive. Yeah. Anyone else have any, any ideas? There's a really big example for procedural, which makes these questions much easier, which can make them much easier. I know and procedural, it's like any type of things that need to go in the court, like your timing, how to um, like format stuff. Exactly. So the federal rules of civil procedure are procedural and they always preempt any state law about procedure. So if you're in federal courts, you always do what the federal rules of civil procedure say, especially when it conflicts with a state law on the same issue. So, federal, so like if you're if it's an eerie question, the answer is always follow the federal rules of civil procedure or follow the federal rules of evidence. All right, let's think of some. I'm gonna give you some examples, and you tell me the procedure substantive. How about statute limitations? Substantive. How about preclusion? Issue preclusion, claim preclusion. Procedural. Procedural, right. I see you moving your cursor too. So I was like thinking it and then I saw that I was like, okay, I'm, I can answer. Um, what else? Procedural is mostly is little. Substantive is most things. Damages, statutes, limitations. What else? Anything else we could think of that's substantive uh, law? I haven't really started super hard doing uh, MBE Civ Pro questions with my students, but this is something I have in my PowerPoint. This is something I, I do uh, definitely focus on. There's a few more ones I had. And last administration, one of my students led me astray and I had to fix the PowerPoint. It was, it was a whole ordeal, so that's the whole thing. All right, at first, PCP considered substantive procedural. We're gonna say- The right to jury trial I'm pretty, is substantive. Oh, jury trial, exactly. That's, that was one of the- asked, Why is it not procedural? Uh, because the court said so. There's not, or there's not always a clear reason why something is procedural versus substantive. And, th and that's something that I had to reckon with, reconcile with, is that like, it's not always common sense what's procedural and what's substantive. You're better off just memorizing what they are. So like preclusion and procedural, damages, statute of limitations, right to a jury trial, that's all substantive. And then max rate, anything that's like FRCP, and it's just about like the timing or, you know, how things are filed, that's going to be a uh, procedural all right what about uh oh okay i kind of answered it yeah 29 yeah 29 are the frcp considered substantive procedural all right let's no, go on and it stands for civil procedure so it has a word procedure in it literally literally all right let's go to pleadings so our good friends twombly and iqbal uh what are the three requirements of a complaint laid out in rule eight of the frcp Short and plain statement for relief. Yep. Yep, that's one. Short and plain statement asking for relief. What else? Is it, that might actually be two. Because it's a short and plain statement of the of like the claim, the facts, and then also asking for relief. Yeah, demand for relief. Okay. Um, I'm sure you ask about, no, no, see it. Does anything need to be pleaded with particularity? Um, I think certain ones, I remember last time, like fraud and mistake. Yeah. 
Fraud, I think fraud, defamation. Yeah, fraud must be pleaded with particularity. Again, some of these things that I remember literally from my 1-0 year, I had a nightmare. Why do they have to be pleaded with particularity? Because the court said so. Yeah, I had a tough 1-0 state pro professor. Tough. All right, what's the significance of the cases Twombly and Iqbal? They just define the well pleaded complaint rule, right? They, they kind of changed what a pleading is, and now we follow that. How many times do you amend a pleading? So this? they have to be plausible. Plausibility is the big thing for those. All right. How many times can you amend the pleading? But less than plausible. And what does that mean? No one knows. All right. What uh how many times can you amend the pleading? Once is a matter of right, I think. Yep, yeah, once is a matter of course, that's for sure. Within 21 days. Once as a matter of right within 21 days. And then after that, does anyone know? Isn't it if the court gives you, like allows you to, or the defense consents to it, you're allowed to as? Yeah, if, the, if both parties consent or the court leaves amending is in the interest of justice. And when is, you know, when might they find justice? Basically, basically all the time. Like very rarely are they gonna say, no, you can't amend. So you can basically amend very often because they don't want, out of date information or you to not be pleading everything that you believe is true and honest. So they're gonna like let you amend whenever you want, most of the time. All right. I didn't make my trip, I grabbed the wrong charger. Uh, ooh, here we go. My Civ Pro professor will be proud. What are 12B defenses? Must they be raised at the first opportunity? This is probably one of the most important questions of the questionnaire. Yeah. What are the 12B defenses and which ones must be raised? At the first opportunities, if you don't use it, you lose it. After, no, that's not a twelve B defense. We can bring it up after. There, there are very like seven very specific ones. Seven very specific. Let's do them in order. What's twelve B one? Subject. Well, well, I think personal jurisdiction has to be raised right the way. Mm, um, not necessarily. No, I think. Well, let's just let's list them first. Okay. So he has personal jurisdiction and what's so, your jurisdiction? One is PJ. And what does that mean? They're saying you, you're asking the court to dismiss the claim for lack of personal jurisdiction, that the plaintiff doesn't have personal jurisdiction. Then two. Then you. It's also jurisdiction. What's the other huge type of jurisdiction that we need? We need PJ and then we need? Subject matter. Exactly. Yeah. Lack of Lack of what is very important about subject matter jurisdiction? We can raise it at any time. Right. So we gave it away. Oh, yeah. So I'm sorry, Brian. You were right about that saying. So personal jurisdiction must be raised uh, at first opportunity. And we can like go in, we'll go more into that after we list more. Well, that just either means your an your answer or your pre-answer. Yeah. Or it's the first time you respond. You can raise the 12B motions in your answer, which is the formal answer to the complaint or the counterclaim, just like how you're responding to this claim against you or in what's called a pre-answer motion where you're not even answering. You're just saying, no, I won't answer yet because they lack this jurisdiction. Right. But just remember that the um, first time you respond, if you don't raise a 12B1 defense of lack of PJ, it's forever uh, waived. Now, on the other hand, lack of subject matter jurisdiction can be raised at any time. Very important. And that um, even during the trial. Anytime. All right, what about three, four, and five? Six is like the most famous one, I guess. That goes back to Twombly and Iqbal. We're not, we're not quite there yet, so let's do three, four, five. What about three? And you know what this is? We're thinking about personal jurisdiction, subject matter jurisdiction, what else is very important? We talked about already. Venue. Venue, excellent. Right, and can that be raised at any time or does it need to be raised at the first opportunity? The first. Exactly. Raise the first opportunity. And there's one more that needs to be raised at first opportunity, right? It's two more. There's two more, okay. Yeah. All right, but well, let's get there. What about fourth? are kind of mushed together. They're, what? Not, they're different from each other. Okay, so 
Well, so Paul, they're all, these are all motion to dismisses. These are all motion to dismisses. Motion to dismiss for lack of personal jurisdiction. Motion to dismiss for lack of subject matter jurisdiction. Yeah. Motion to dismiss for lack of venue. Now the next two, yeah, are very close. Improper service and what's the other one? Improper process. Right. Which is four and which is five? Um, so I'm looking, yeah, so subject matter jurisdiction is actually first, then personal jurisdiction, then the yeah. yeah. insufficient process. And what is process? That means you need both a summons and a complaint. The complaint is what 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 your deal is, and the summons is saying you're being summoned to court on, you know, where I'm suing you. Right. And so those you have to do it first opportunity. Absolutely. So yeah. four is improper process and five is improper service of process. So like the process server is 17, or you wait, you took too long to serve it, or um you served it like you went to someone, you went to a person's house and you gave it to the gardener. These are all improper methods of service. And these have to be raised at the first opportunity. The actual summons or the way it was delivered. Yeah. So four and five like seem like they're the same. They're actually different, but it's not a huge distinction that they really care about or that anyone really cares about. I was, you do say that there's definitely an MBE question where they're both the answer and you got to distinguish between them. So it's it's a little bit trickier. Okay, so must be raised at first opportunity. And then uh, improper service of property of process also must be raised at first opportunity. Sorry, I, this is what I did think. Lack of subject matter jurisdiction is one. That can be raised at any time. Then two through five, they have to be brought up at their first opportunity. Then we close it up with uh, six and seven, which maps that are pre-related. Um, and these uh, can be also raised at any time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Six is like the one that Paul was taught. Six is like what everyone thinks when they say motion to dismiss. That's failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. That's really like the Twombly and Iqbal. So 12B6 is like probably like the most common that you'll see in practice. For sure. And then there's seven. Seven is failure. Yeah, failure. Indispensable party, rather, which is actually different than required, but we'll go over that later. I was trying to copy how Paul spelled it. I was like, I don't think that's how you spell it. All right, so failure to join indispensable party. So, right, remember this thing pretty cold right here. I know we kind of labor our way through it, but make sure that this is pretty coldly memorized, that um, when you have a, a 12B defense, there are lack of PJ, lack of venue, improper service, and improper service of process. They need to be brought up uh, at the first time, either the answer, the pre-answer, the first time you speak on the case, or they're forever dismissed. Whereas lack of SMJ, failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted, and failure to join an indispensable party can be raised at any time. Yeah. So you can do a pre-answer motion saying, you know, moving to dismiss for lack of personal jurisdiction, then your answer moving to dismiss for lack of subject matter jurisdiction. But what you can't do is a pre-answer motion that moves to dismiss for subject matter jurisdiction, and then an answer that moves to dismiss for lack of personal jurisdiction. All right, um, for time's sake, Matt, I'm gonna have a couple of these you fire off answers for, and I'll just write them down and let's try to do it quicker to you know, make sure we finish up the material for today. So what's the relation What's the relation back doctrine? How would you define that for us? Relation back, this is also a rule that like it's worth going through later on, like on your own reading it, rule 15. That's if, um, let's say, like you have, an, you have another claim against a party, like, like you're suing this person because uh, they hit you, you can also add claims that they defamed you or that they, you know, that they breached your contract or that they didn't mow your lawn, even though they said they would. And that is raising independent claims. You can also raise claims that come from the same nucleus of operative fact. So let's say you sue someone for hitting you with their car for one thing, for let's say a tort of assault. And then later on, you wanna sue them for the tort of battery but the statute of limitations for battery expired or told, you can still raise that 
because it's what's called, um, do you recall like what, what they call for it? Like the statute of limitations is frozen. Yeah, frozen, yeah. Yeah. So you can still sue for things even after the statute of limitations if it's in the same nexus of operative fact, this is like the supplemental jurisdiction language, as a claim that you're already suing them for. Yeah, um, relation back again is super tough concept, but what it really gets to is um, another claim arises and we're just gonna be able to tie that claim back to the original claim. Um, and and that's also also that for parties. Mm -hmm. And that's when like you see someone and then you realize, wait, I meant to sue someone else. Exactly. Only do that if, like, it was an honest mistake, like you didn't realize that you sued the wrong person. Like, let's say, like, you sued someone's insurance company, but that insurance company, uh, you know, sold all their assets to a different company a month before. So you actually have to sue a different company. So it has to be like an honest mistake. It can't just be that you didn't, you weren't, you were lazy and didn't do your research. And like the party that you meant to sue should have some kind of notice that they were meant to be sued and not a different company or a different person. Exactly. That's that's another way of understanding the relation back. Like right? you exactly. meant to sue this one party and it was a reasonable, honest mistake and the other party had noticed and now you're just substituting the names. If it was like a stupid mistake on your fault, then that document isn't going to prevail. All right, we got to move forward at a pretty rapid pace here, Matt. So let's go with cross claims and I'll just explain this to everyone. A cross claim is when you uh, sue a co-defendant, a co-party. Yeah. Right. And a counterclaim is when you make a claim against an opposing party. Yeah. So like when the defendant wants to sue the plaintiff. Mm. Generally, but the, you can also have different kinds of counterclaims. All right. Now we have permissive versus compulsory counterclaims. Yeah. So permissive um, may be brought and compulsory must be brought and we know they're compulsory anyone besides matt know when it must be brought a compulsory counterclaim we've talked about this idea before it's not the first time it's coming up it arose out of the same transaction occurrence as the original complaint our good old friend and when did that come up when we were talking about nucleus of operative fact and we were doing supplemental jurisdiction some of these concepts replay themselves when why have to be brought it doesn't mean like you legally have to bring it. What it means is that if you don't bring it in this case, you're precluded it from bringing it again. So when it says must, it means like you must do it now or never. It doesn't mean you must do it now. Yeah, use, lose it, use it or lose it. It's All not, right. you won't bring it, I'll sue you. Or so you're... what is, why discovery? How can we trust that the parties will give up potentially some sort of information in good faith? It's like more of an open-ended thing. We can just skip this. Yeah, we just do. Are discovery sanctions different from rule 11 sanctions? Yes, right? Yeah, Rule 11 sanctions are like when you're pleading and, you know, you're lying or being ridiculous or harassing the party. So you can like do contempt of court, attorney's fees, um, taking away their bar license, um, dismissing the claim, uh, you know, making the lawyer retake law classes, which is definitely the most humiliating sanction. And then discovery sanctions can include like, yeah, fail, like you can lose certain claims, like you can no longer bring this claim. And also like you can no longer request production, you can no longer do depositions. So like discovery sanctions also include lots of obviously discovery related things, whereas rule okay. 11 on pleadings don't involve that. Right, rule, a common rule 11 sanction is filing a frivolous complaint. Yeah. And I appreciate everyone bearing with us if we go a little bit over time today because this is a tough subject. All right, a party may obtain all non-privileged information that is blank and blank. Can anyone fill these blanks? I think the second one is reasonably calculated to... So it's R and P. Two, like two, one words. So the first... Reliable and, is that R? Relevant. Relevant. Shoot. Relevant. Relevant. And probative? Proportional. Proportional, oh man. So it has to be irrelevant, like it has to be obviously related to this case and it has to be proportional. It can't be, oh, um, you may have, like, oh, you may have written this email about the company, give me all your emails since 1980. 
you might say, give me all your emails between 2007 and 2011. So it has to be proportional to the number. All right, let's, let's keep it moving. What much parties always disclose initially under Rule 26A without the other party first requesting it? I'm right on you, Matt. What you got first? Um, so evidence that you plan to use, potential witnesses. I think those are the main ones, but I can, let me check. How many depositions may a party normally take and interrogatories and request, and, um, request for production? So depots interrogatories and requests for production. Anyone have some numbers for me? It's a tough one. I think I have some guesses. Depositions, just one, I'm sure, unless you need it. Just right? Oh, oh, never I'm mind. Really not I thought it meant like of multiple people. Like, why would you want well, not per person? Like, how many total does each party get? Do you have the answer to this, Matt? Uh, what did you uh, depositions? I think it's it's yeah, twenty five interrogatories, twenty five requests for productions, ten depositions, but the parties can mutually agree to more. I think that's correct. And then okay, going back to required disclosures. Uh, names and addresses and telephone numbers of each witness. Um, the designate uh, who you plan to depose and identifications of the evidence that you plan to use. So basically what I said before, but like more detail, like not just the witnesses, but like their addresses too. Yeah. Um, is there a time restriction for the depositions? Like, um, what do you mean by time? To, I believe it has to be like, I want to say something like it, it can't be more than eight hours, but let me check. What are the rules for electronically stored information? It cannot be destroyed, right? Okay, so a deposition is limited is limited to seven hours over the course of one day, not eight hours, seven hours. Just because like it would be crazy to do longer than that. It would be insane. Um, yeah, so electronically stored information, ESI. And not that seven hours isn't crazy. Um, it basically means that you can't just destroy all your emails and text messages and voice memos, like in anticipation of litigation, just like you can't destroy your papers. But since like right. information is more new, you know, there's less, it's less what clear. About, what about the work product doctrine? Work um, product so doctrine. Know. So okay. we're, Work product is anything that your lawyer makes or maybe someone hired by your lawyer, like a map maker. Oh my, well, I guess yeah, maybe a map maker, that's kind of random. Like, like an accountant that your lawyer has hired to make some kind of document that supports you in anticipation of litigation. Yeah. I think the font is changing. No, I just, whatever, it was just cool. Um, Let's see. Oh yeah, think of depositions. Do you ever want to see the funniest deposition of all time? Uh, Lil Wayne. It is hilarious. They ask him and he just gives the funniest answers you'll ever see. All right, what is the difference? Yeah, probably you've seen it. All right, what is the difference between a TRO and a preliminary injunction? Yeah, so the, what TRO stands for? Temporary restraining order. Yeah. Um, so it's not like, it's not literally a restraining order. Like, it's not like, oh, you have to, I mean, it can be. It's not always like, oh, you have to be a hundred feet from this person. Like, it's usually means like you have to refrain from doing this action. It's basically like a pre-injunction. And yes, 14, yeah, TRO can only last for 14 days or it can, but it can also be extended for another 14 days. But anything longer than that, then it's considered a preliminary injunction, which is more difficult to get. Right, I said no it's irreparable harm, but it seems it's a four-part test. What else you got for me? So um, the four-part test for a preliminary, and, yeah, so, so for TRO, you need to show that, like, you, you have to show, like, what the immediate harm is. You have to say, like, why you don't have to give notice to the other party. For preliminary injunction, you need to give notice. And then you have to give some money to the court that assuming that, like, if you're wrong and, like, they could have always engaged in this behavior, like, they get to be compensated. So TRO involves, you know, you have to give some money, 
you have to get you have to explain why you can't why you don't have time to give notice to the other party and you have to show the harm yeah that yeah. seems like three parts is there a fourth part notice proof of reparable harm money no, 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 no that's that's all for tro oh oh yeah. okay um what about preliminary injunction yeah so likelihood of success on the merits that's the most important factor by far and then you also have uh, the threat of irreparable harm if the preliminary injunction is not given. Like, oh, if the falafel shop across the street isn't stopped, um, then my bike, so my bike store next door will smell like falafel. I don't know. That's probably not very harmful. Uh, the harm alleged by the movement, movement outweighs any harm to the non-moving party. You know, on one hand, the falafel shop has to go out of business. On the other hand, the bike shop doesn't smell like falafel. So it clearly harms one party more than the other. And then the public interest, which is kind of like, no one really knows what that means. It's kind of whatever the court wants it to be. But the most important factor is likelihood of success. Because if it's not clear that like you'll succeed in the case later on, then they probably won't do the injunction. They won't order the injunction. I'm a little confused. Which one do you need notice for? Preliminary, preliminary injunction. That's what I thought. Okay. Because it's longer. A te temporary restraining order can only be up, up for 14 days or 28 if extended. But because it's only a short time, you don't have to give notice. Mm -hmm. and yeah, Paul said, like, keeping the status quo. So, All right. Here we go. Some tough ones. So permissive joinder. Um, permissive joinder is bringing in another claim, right? Um, How do you describe permissive joinder to us, Matt? So like we talked about like permissive versus required before, permissive means the party that you can join if you have a common nexus, like it's supplemental and you still have jurisdiction and like they're involved and like can recover, but you don't have to bring them in. Oh, and common nucleus and jurisdiction. Okay. And then require joinder. That's a party that and like this is usually for like corporations and like insurance companies, not really for like people, but it can happen. That's if like the court cannot grant relief without having this party in, without without this party being in the lawsuit. And that can be like if you're suing someone for a car accident, that person's insurance company needs to be in the suit because that insurance company is what does the payout. So if a party is deemed necessary, but joinder isn't feasible, they must dismiss the case, right? Usually, yeah. And, but just being required, yeah. Wait, let me, let me see this. Sorry. Because there's a difference between required, but necessary, right? Difference between... Yeah, so, oh, so no, required and necessary are the same, but indispensable is a separate thing. So... You can have a required party and no, like jurisdiction isn't feasible and you can still say, you know what, we'll just keep going. But if you decide that we can't possibly continue this without that party, then that party becomes indispensable and you have to dismiss the case. And that has like, that has factors as, you know, everything does to make it complicated. So you look at, um, would this party really be prejudiced if they weren't there? Um, could this prejudice be lessened through some other method? Can you still like adequately render this judgment without having this party there? And would this party that would not be joined, sorry, I know this is very confusing. This party that is, would not be joined, like would they have an adequate remedy somewhere else? So the most obvious example for that is if you're in federal court and like if you feel that this party won't have adequate remedies or like that these factors are not met, they will dismiss the case. Excellent, man. You did an amazing job explaining that. I can kind of dumb it down where it's like permissive joiner means we're allowed to bring this party. Required joiner means we have to bring this party. And if they determine that the required party is indispensable, then they have to dismiss the case if they can't bring them in. Yeah. Simple, simple enough. All right. For an example, for an adequate remedy would just be like filing in state court if it's dismissed by a federal court. All right. What is per so I'm gonna teach everyone this real quick. Intervention, impleter, interpleader, the three eyes, right? Intervention is when I'm intervening, a third party, I'm like, whoa, 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 that's my baby. I want a piece of the pie, you know? I'm jumping in, I'm intervening into the case. 
impleader is when two parties are litigating and we need to bring someone into the case. That's, you know, the impleader. We're bringing them in, right? Interpleader is when I'm suing uh, two parties, let's say, and those two parties need to figure some things out between themselves. It's usually like uh, over property, like whose property actually is it? They need to interplead and figure out who's the proper defendant, and then I'll sue them. So remember, impleader, we're bringing someone in, we're impleading them. Interpleader, we're forcing two parties to interplead amongst each other. And intervention means I'm jumping in, like I'm the third party who's jumping into the case. Interpleader, so yeah. Intervention is like the opposite of joinder. Joinder is you're in the suit and you're bringing in someone else. Intervention is you're out of the suit and you're forcing your way in. Is the opposite more like a yin and yang thing joinder something like that. is the yin and yang yeah whereas intervention is a third party stepping in joinder is a third party being dragged in basically dragged, yeah and that's impleader impleader is how to drag in the defendant. And we could have statutory or rule interpleader. And it's about diversity. And just the main difference is that um, rule interpleader is only $500, right? Where statutory is gonna be 75,000 for diversity. Those questions can get tough. Um, and then, as a side note, what is interpleader? That's the most confusing part of. We keep saying this is the hardest, most confusing part of Super Pro. It never ends. I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's all hard and confusing. Interpleaders interpleading. But after um, Super Pro, it really just gets easier from there. Yeah. Uh, defendants need to litigate amongst themselves determine who owns the property, for example, right? Like if I'm suing because I, I tripped and you don't know whose property I tripped on, it's a piece of grass, we need to figure out who owns the piece of grass, that would be an interpleader action. Um, so impleader and interpleader, they sound similar, but they're quite different, right? Impleader, we're bringing them in, interpleader, we're forcing them to interplead amongst each other. So class actions, I think it's can't is the act I remember. Yeah. Now, now, Adequacy, numerosity, and typicality, commonality. A commonality, there has to be like, comp, like the questions of law and fact have to be common to all the people in the class. Adequacy of representation. You need to have a class representative who adequately represents the other people. So if the class representative is one, like in a coma and can't actually be in the suit, they're not, they can't do it. Or if they're trying to get 50 million in damages and everyone else is trying to get five dollars in damages or the reverse and they wouldn't or i guess that, that goes to typicality actually i mean i combine yeah. them Adequate right. typicality relate to the representative commonality and numerosity are about the class as a whole exactly and typicality is important it has to be the claim you're making is typical of everyone if if the representative suffered eighty thousand dollars in damages but everyone else suffered five dollars in damages it's not typical all right, what must then be found before a court will certify a class? Uh, Matt, what's the answer to this one? What must be found before they will certify a class? That damages would be adequate or, or that damages could be... That, that a class action is like, would be better than just a normal suit, um, that there's you know minimal diversity, assuming that like it's on state courts. All right, and what are different types of classes? Well, there's gym class, math class, I don't know. What are different types of classes? Yeah, so you, you have the normal kind of class where you opt in, and then you have the kind of class where, where people like affirmatively opt in, and then you have the kind of class where people in the class are automatically in the class, they can't opt out. And that generally involves whether you want injunctive relief or monetary relief. If you want monetary relief, it's almost always opt-in. Like you don't have to be part of the class. You don't have to like try to get $20 from Johnson & Johnson if you don't want it. But if it's, if it's injunctive relief, you know, the class is suing uh, Walmart for discriminatory treatment. 
you can't opt out of something for injunctive relief because that affects behavior. They can't, you can't say Walmart has to stop discriminating against these people, but they can still discriminate against those people who weren't in the class. Okay, I know I've said it seven times, but I think this is it. I think this is the hardest part of civil procedure. Claim preclusion and issue preclusion. Race judicata and collateral estoppel. I don't even want to think about it too hard. Matt, can you just uh, do your best to give me a definition of claim preclusion? Yeah, so claim preclusion. So first we have to go over like the difference between claim preclusion and issue preclusion. Okay. Claim preclusion. Talk all right. Entire, like every, like a whole enchilada. Like the, let's say there's a car accident. Claim preclusion involves the entire instance. You know, this happened, you know, 337, May 17th. Like that whole instance is the claim. And then the issue could be breach of contract, not breach of contract, but like the tort of battery, the tort of assault, negligence. Each of those are separate issues. Okay. So what are the elements of claim preclusion? Yeah, so for claim preclusion, you have to have, so both parties have to be the same or in privity, which we'll go over later. Um, you have to have, a prior judgment, which was final, and we'll go over what that means. And it has to be the same claim. So what that means is you have two people, they're in a car accident. Uh, the plaintiff sues the defendant for negligence. Uh, you have a final judgment. And then a year later, the defendant is like, you know what? I wanna sue the plaintiff for their negligence. So he can no longer do that because this, claim was already litigated, you can no longer litigate it again. So if that defend, so that defendant's counterclaim of negligence would be an example of a compulsory counterclaim. He had to have brought it back then. And now that he didn't, he can no longer bring it. It's claim precluded. I put a, a thought that it made me think about, a thought that made me think about, but it's more or less civil jeopardy, right? Yeah. Like it's That's like double jeopardy in civil. Right, it's like double jeopardy in civil court. All right, what about privity? Yeah, so privity is when you have another, this is almost always for usually companies, but it can be for people, I guess, hypothetically. So if you're suing a company for, you know, let's say $50,000 for, I don't even know, uh, wrongful termination. And then a year later, that company is bought out by a different company. And you're saying, you know what? It's now a different company. I'm no longer claim precluded. You sue them again because your first case didn't work out. That second company, because it's just, it's essentially the old company that was just merged or bought out, that's, they're in privity. So you still have the same parties. So it's when you have a legally recognized relationship. I think also you can do like employer, employee can also be a type of privity. Yeah, and we'll talk about privy in uh, real property too, but that wasn't bad because that was a good way of looking at it from a civil procedure lens, usually between companies and when it's an old company, it's a new company. So right. like when you buy a house from someone, you're in privy with them. I guess that's the most famous example. Yeah. Um, okay. So what are the elements of issue preclusion? So remember, race judicata, claim preclusion, that's like civil double jeopardy. Issue preclusion, collateral estoppel, is about the specific issue, like whether Jay was negligent or not. So yeah. Matt, I can never keep this straight. What are the elements of issue for yeah, My advice is not now, but like later, just make a make a T chart, make a, a Venn diagram, make like make just write it out, like make some kinds of graphs and charts, because that's really the only way you're going to understand this, is by writing it out. So issue preclusion, you need to have a valid and final judgment, you know, which is similar to claim preclusion. The issue has to be identical. You actually the issue has to actually have been litigated, and essential, and we'll talk about that more. And the party that you're trying to enforce issue preclusion again against had the right to litigate it in the past. So what, what makes this different from claim preclusion is that you can have non-mutual and non-privity issue preclusion. You can bring issue preclusion against the party who is not in the first lawsuit. So can anyone think of an example of that? I can. What's your example? Like if we have A versus uh, a mall and the mall was negligent for having the stump out, 
And then B was also injured on the same stump. Well, that issue, whether the mall was negligent in having the stump is issue preclusion, right? We've already litigated that issue. That's that a great point because let's say that's, that's assuming like the negligence is essential to the claim and it was actually decided. So let's say party A sues the mall because they tripped over the stump, but then the mall dismisses, gets the case dismissed because of improper service of process. The issue of negligence was never actually decided. Exactly. So even though there might be claim preclusion against party A, party, there's no issue preclusion against party B because the negligence issue was never actually litigated and decided. So when it comes to things that are heavily tested and sneaky, I think that's important for issue preclusion. The issue must actually have been decided. And for claim preclusion, it must be the same parties. I think if you could just tease those two things out from today's discussion, that's not bad. All right. This, Matt, I could never describe to my grave the difference between non-mutual collateral estoppel, both offensive and defensive. I, I, I need you to take over the wheel right here. What do you got? When offensive is when you are, so, so when your party, B, so your party B, you were not, so there's a first lawsuit between party A and party B. There's an issue that was actually decided. Like let's say it was a car accident and party B was found to be negligent. Then party C wants to offensively, who was not involved in the first suit, wants to offensively then sue party B and wants the court to say they were negligent. We don't even have to prove it because they were already found to be negligent. That's offensive. Then defensive would be, let's say, party A and party B were in the suit. Party B was, let's say, found to be non-negligent. Right, so that was defense. All right. So just repeat defensive, the same thing you're saying? Defensive is when it's being raised defensively by the party being sued, is when, is, is when they're defensively saying an issue is already precluded. Offensively is when you're saying a defense. Wow. So defensive is precluding a claim. Offensive is precluding a defense. Like, it's, it's, like a, it's like a sword, defensive is like a shield. Okay, so offensive would be there's a, an issue decided in A versus B, and now C is trying to sue B and, and bring up that issue. Whereas defensive is A sues B and tries to bring up an issue, and B is like, or A is like, that issue's already been decided. Yeah. So it's harder to do offensive non-mutual issue preclusion because you're basically telling a party that they can't raise a defense. So you have to show that the party that's suing had some reason that they were not involved in the first suit. Like either because the MBE used non-mutual collateral estoppel and eerie questions in asking which state to go by. Yeah, so that's a common question. So from what I understand, you determine the rule by the render in state. So the state that had the first case, or we can talk about that later on. All right, yeah, let's keep it moving. So why is there preclusion in the first place and is it fair? Um, what do you think, Matt? What's a good way? I think it's fair. Um, I mean, it protect, like you have to have final suits. If you didn't have claim preclusion, you could just sue again saying, oh, I lost this time, but maybe I'll get lucky next time. And it's the same concept as double jeopardy. Like preclusion is more complicated, but you're basically saying if a court actually decided that this party was negligent in this incident, it would be inefficient and wasteful and take too long for the court to have to decide it again. I totally agree with you. Claim preclusion is fair, the same concept as double jeopardy and issue preclusion is cool because it's efficient. Like we already did this issue, why do it again? All right, let's try and blow through these motions. What is a motion for judgment on the pleadings and how is it different from a motion to dismiss? So judgment on the pleadings uh, just means there's no, uh, there, well, how would you describe judgment on the pleadings? I mean, yeah, so I think judge, it's very similar to motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim. But I think, like, for judgment on the pleadings, like, they're stating a claim. But if you look at the facts, it's pretty obvious that, you know, it's not going to win. Like, you can say, oh, like, they tripped me when I wasn't looking. And, like, you actually have it. They tripped you. And, you know, you meet all the other requirements. So you do have a claim. But based I on... Like if you weren't looking, you're kind of at fault. So that I would be agree with you. A judgment on the pleadings is very similar to a motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim. And they can, in a lot of cases, either one could be brought. 
And it's like, which would be brought first? Judgment on the pleadings is the first motion to dismiss. What then, I as, like, you did state a claim, but it was just a really bad claim. Yeah, here's a better idea. Um, judgment on the pleadings, judgment on the pleadings is like summary judgment before discovery. Like you just are right away saying there's no genuine dispute of material fact. Like I don't even need to do discovery just on its face. This is trash. Okay. Then a motion for judgment summary judgment is after discovery, right? Yeah. There's no genuine. I think it has to be within 30 days of the close of discovery. Yeah. Within 30 days of discovery. When the judge says so. 30 days after discovery, there's no genuine issue of material fact. Our burdens different for the plaintiff and the, they're the same burden, right? And either party can bring it yeah yeah it's like the bur yeah you have to look at all the facts in the in the light most favorable to the non-moving party to the party that's not moving for summary judgment in the most favorable to the non-moving party right so a sues b and a says all he claims all this stuff against b and b filing summary judgment or motion on the pleadings or um directed verse whatever it may be is basically saying look if all the things you're saying are true, A, I'm not disputing it. Everything you're saying is true. But even so, there's no claim here. Like, you're saying I called you a, an ugly face, but that's not actionable, right? Like, I'm allowed to call you an ugly face. I'm not denying I called you an ugly face. I'm just saying that's not an actionable claim. Yeah. All right. You, um, could, you, can, you can do summary judgment based on, like, look at all my evidence. Look how great it is. Like, even in the light most favorable to them, I'd win. But you could also do look at the other party's lack of evidence look how little evidence they have, even in the light most favorable to them, I'd still win. So you can do summary judgment based on them, like how great your evidence is, but also how little evidence the other party has, like their lack of evidence. All right. And then for this one, um, JMOL, judgment as a matter of law, in Florida, we call that a directed verdict. But this is basically the same thing as summary judgment, but it's during or after the trial. And if you're going to raise a renewed JMOL, you had to have raised the initial JMOL, right? Yes. All right. Um, write out the standards for different motions. Oof. Uh, is yes. there any? Uh, in the light most favorable to the non moving party. J JMOL, does anyone know? It involves, it includes the words of the a reasonable jury. Right. That's summary judgment. That no part that no reasonable jury could find in behalf of the party, right? That's yeah. a directed verdict, what we call it JMOL. Yeah. No reasonable jury could find in favor. Right, those are good pieces. Um, what are some important dates with regard when to motions can or must be brought? So we already said the one for summary judgment within 30 days of the close of discovery. Does anyone know the JMOL dates? There's some stuff in the chat. He said within 30 days of end of discovery. Yeah. And then a JMOL is during trial, right? Yeah. So that has to be before, I think before the jury like begins deliberation. And then a renewed JMOL which can only be on the issues, like only on the claims that you brought JMOL for in the first place. Uh, yeah, so relief of judgment is within a year, but you have to bring a new JMOL within 28 days of the close of this, within, excuse me, the close of trial. The new trial, is it 30 days? I think it's also 28 days. New trial is also 28 days? All right, sorry about that. Sorry, you And but, then- uh, me, that, is, that is one year. That, be, that can be because um like you found evidence that would have like helped you win that you could not have reasonably discovered before and like if it was in your desk and you just didn't look that's not good but like if it's like in a hidden warehouse that was only uncovered after the trial isn't it true that there's at any time if the judge decides that you know things were really bad you know, the JMOL isn't before the jury is sworn in because the jury is sworn in like at the beginning of trial. It's before they um, deliberate, but I'll, I'll look. No, 
he's talking about JMO is before the jury is sworn in. I think you're thinking about criminal, and that's about when Jeopardy attaches. Jeopardy attaches after a jury's been impaneled for criminal law, but I don't know, maybe we're on some movie theater. All right. um, let's go to appeals and new trials. What is the final judgment rule and what makes a judgment final? All right, man, I'm just going to have you narrate. What is the final judgment rule? What makes uh, a judgment final? Is any final judgment appealable? What do you got for us? Yeah, so I'm, as far as I understand, every final judgment, any final judgment is appealable. Yeah, it's when it's decided on the merits, but also like there are lots of things that can be appealed before it's final, but the default is that it has to be final. Appealed until final judgment. Um, and if it's, which is called an interlocutory appeal? Yes. Certain things. All right. When is an immediate appeal allowed? What you got first, Matt? Uh, like qualitative immunity. Not qualitative immunity. What do you call that? Qualified immunity. Excuse me. Like that's a very common example. Also, like uh, certain like preliminary injunctions. Um, when a statute says so, a federal statute or a state statute, I guess. Uh, when you have the certification of a class. I was gonna say certifying a class. Yeah. 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 Anytime for the case is submitted to the jury, which means like the jury begins like deliberating. But when a jury is sworn in, like that's at the beginning of a trial, like when that comes into play is for criminal jeopardy. Right. Not when they're sworn in, but before they've done deliberations. OK, great. Well, when um, they're submitted, that means like, the, like everything is done, like both parties have arrested the judge is like the jury. It's in your hands now. This one's pretty tough that certifying a class is actually one of the exceptions that's immediately applicable. All right. What are statutory exceptions to the final judgment rule? Yeah, most of them are not important. The only one that is important for the bar are injunctions. Injunctions. Okay. The what is receiverships? And I don't, I couldn't tell you what a receivership is. Um, Sorry. Let's focus. Uh, I want to get to this, Matt. Um, what's a certified appeal? Certified appeal is when the trial court, so the law is really made by intermediate by the appellate and Supreme Courts. So the trial court says, I'm not really clear on what this law is, or this is like an undecided question. And he kind of writes it, or she writes it on a little piece of paper and says, Can you please like take this and like, more fully explain like what the law is on this issue and then bring it back to me. Okay. Um, is it allowable? Yes. Only if the court of appeals allows it. Only if the court of appeals says yes. If they say no, then it, the trial court just has to deal with not understanding the law. But I feel like they'd say yes. Uh, again, I've never really seen that a certified appeal. I just know. I know it's on the bar. I know. I never saw it tested, but it's like that. It's, it was in my Fed courts class. Okay. Well, yeah, they write it on a little piece of paper. They write it on a little piece of paper. Okay, a big piece of paper, but it has to be written. I don't think the, the size of the paper is not dispositive. No, I know it. Whatever. All right. What is the collateral order doctrine? Yeah. So that is something that is separate from the merits of the actual issue, but. Like it's a, it's a question that should be appealed for a better answer. And I can't think of a great example for that, but I can after the break. And it's something that like, if you don't appeal this now, one, it, it has to be separate from the main issue. And it's something that could be resolved by bringing it up. If you don't do it now, it can't be reviewed later on. Yeah, I've seen it with like divorce proceedings at some point, like, yeah, you have to bring this issue now or, it's forever lost. And the reason is because it's like, it's so important to decide it now. And if we don't put, decide it now, then it's forever lost and it's, it's rare. All right, how soon after close of trial must an appeal be filed? We said 28 days, right? Yeah. Is this different depending on whether the case was tried by jury or by bench? So it's, it has, it's either, it's when 28 days from when I think the jury reads out the, like the verdict or if the bench trial like when the judge like slams a hammer down and like says, this is the verdict. So it's really like, yeah, it's really the same. Just like depends on like what the jury does to finish what the judge does to finish. All right. How soon after the close of trial must a motion for a new trial be filed? When will the court grant it? Also. Within 20 days, right? So if you know that movie 28 days later. Oh. Kind of like 28 days later. I never put that together. 
I was today years old when I realized what that movie's about and when I learned that tag. I don't, I don't think that's about Jury. I mean, it could be. I've never seen it. Oh, I never saw the movie yet. I just kind of made sense. I think that's not about actually a girl breaking up with a boy and what they do for uh, 20 so years. Corporal Grant. Uh, a new trial, right? Let me see for appeal. Um, all right, we're almost done. Thank you all for bearing okay, with us. They will grant a new trial for any issue. Okay, you're right. It is 30 days for appeal, which is very arbitrary. Why it's 28 days for a new trial? You're right. It is oh, right. 30 days for appeal, 20 days for a new trial. See, I had a feeling that it was 38 days for appeal. 20, I mean, 30 days for appeal, 20 days for JMOL, renewed motion, new trial. But there is one thing that's 30 days. I don't know. Yeah, that's correct, Paul. 30 days for appeal, 28 days for new trial, JMOL. Good job. I knew there was a 30-day thing. Okay. Grant, um, a new trial for any reason that a new trial has been granted before, which is like, that's really up to them. They'd have to give it to you in the fact. Like, uh, what's some reasons for new trial? Can anyone think of? Um. Manifest uh, justice or manifest weight of the evidence? Yeah, like the judge, what, yeah, jury misconduct, judge misconduct, witness misconduct. Um, evidence yeah. against the manifest weight of the evidence. If one of the parties introduces evidence uh, after being told that they can't introduce it, if they say something in front of the jury that the jury wasn't supposed to hear, if the witnesses were like peeking, I don't, it's a, for, it could be a variety of things. There's no federal editor. Am I correct about that? Yeah, that would violate uh, the Seventh Amendment, is what they say. Seventh Amendment. I feel like that's cruel and unusual punishment. No, it's Seventh Amendment. No federal editor, but there is a, they can decrease. Does everyone know what that means? That on the federal court, they can't uh, increase the um, damages. Can state courts? Depends on the state, but yeah. yeah. In the state that's a great answer judge can lower or order a new trial right yeah uh, so, yeah, so judge, there's, and there's remitter remitter is lowering editor is adding federal mm -hmm. courts can't can't say oh no fifty thousand is too low you're now five hundred thousand they'd have to do a new trial but they can't yes, which one would violate the seventh amendment according so the courts or the supreme court has said that editor would violate the seventh amendment because yeah. The party that decides damages to say that a party owes more than a jury decided violates the Seventh Amendment, so that's not allowed in federal courts. In He's some totally right. allowed. I thought it would violate the Eighth Amendment because it's like that's cruel and unusual punishment, but that's totally ridiculous. It violates the Seventh Amendment because you have a right to a jury trial in certain cases when, mo when money's on the line. Yeah. Here, they're just arbitrarily, you know, giving you a money uh, determination without your jury trial. So that's a good point. All right, other miscellaneous. Let's let's run through this and call it uh, a lecture, and then we'll come back after the break and look at at least a couple um pro essays. So, what's the significance of Rule Eleven? What behaviors or parts of litigation does it cover? And equally, what does it not cover? I don't really know where I was going with that second part. Um, I guess that just that discovery sanctions are like are their own thing. Right, Rule Eleven is for the lawyer sanctions. Is that fair Rule enough? On like pleadings and complaints and motions. Safe harbor, that's 21 days? Yeah, so you have to give the other party 21 days to correct. Otherwise you can't sanction, otherwise you can't move for sanctions, but the court can decide one party has to be sanctioned on their own. Um, sua sponte. Yeah, sua sponte. And they don't, and don't, doesn't mean. So you can't act frivolously, you can't harass. You can't um, make arguments that you know are incorrect. You can't lie about the facts. You have to, you know, you have to swear on an affidavit or something that the facts are reasonably correct. You, you, like if you argue something that turns out to be wrong, it's okay as long as you were like reasonably, reasonably diligent in finding that out. And, you know, if you're making this argument, then the Supreme Court decides, changes the law, and your argument is now incorrect, you have to change it but you're not automatically in violation. Like you have time to change it because it was once correct. Awesome. All right, let's try and finish this up for the good people who are yeah. probably dozing off by now. And I do want us to come back and look at some of these essays. So let's try and finish timely. Uh, what we got? 
What's the liability for 11 sanctions? Yeah. Does anyone know? Like, list them out. Uh, like, yeah. Yeah, we mentioned them before. Like, you can, yeah, you can owe money. You can get your bar license suspended. You can be forced to go back to school. Um, you can be barred from practice. Yeah. Yeah, take a, exactly. They might make you take a class. Um, uh, you, like, making you pay the other party for having to deal with your BS. All right, that's pretty obvious. What's a pretrial conference? How are they scheduled? Can it be modified? So a pretrial conference is what the parties have to go to after like the answer and complaint, they meet with each other and they kind of decide, this is how long discovery will take. This is how many depositions and derogatories. Uh, this is what's off limits. This is what's not. Um, like this is like when the trial will be. And then the judge kind of finalizes that. And it's very hard to modify it after it's finalized. I think only, I think, in the man, interest of manifest justice, I will look at the exact language. Hard to amend final. Uh, what would you call it? The final um, pre conference uh, order. So they can, order. yeah, it can only be modified by the court to prevent manifest injustice. Can only be modified to prevent. This, is, this, is, this sets out like when discovery can take place, when the trial, you know, yeah. might take place, um, like what will happen, you know, if will, will they meet for settlement? So it is a big deal. That was someone's rapper name last administration, Manifest Injustice. All right, what are sanctions for attorneys or parties ignoring pretrial rules or not even bothering to appeal? Any sanctions, right? Yeah, anyone that anything that we mentioned, but also like the court might just like dismiss uh, just my rule in favor of one party or dismiss certain claims or defenses. And oh yeah, it can also dismiss claims, et cetera. Like it's not just the on the person, but it's also on the case. We talked about that earlier. Like rule eleven is on the is on the person, but uh, discovery sanctions can be about the case too. So what is a writ of mandamus? Let's skip that. Is that issue Marbury versus Madison? We can just skip that. Not super important. It's just like ordering a lower, yeah, exactly. Like if let's say like a judge is actually like the grand mother of one of the parties and refuses to recuse, then a higher court can issue a writ of mandamus saying like, move out of the way. Yeah, it's basically a court order. Um, what is a default? Is it the same thing as a default judgment? So it's inactivity in the case? Yeah. In well, the that's something that, that, that would result in a default. Could result in default, right? So if you're just, if you're not like, if you're not filing an answer, if like you're not, yeah, if you're just not like. And do, what's the difference between a default and a default judgment? Sorry? What's the difference between a default and default judgment? Default is like the warning. Default judgment is like, you have this default and if you don't do anything soon like we're going to give you a default judge we're going to default judge in favor of the other party and wouldn't the default judgment constitute a judgment on the merits if the if the defendant never said anything in the in for default so he wouldn't have a say in it but it would be a default judgment yeah, it, i mean it, a judgment on the merits it, is. it does have claim preclusion so it means uh, the party can't bring that claim again because they they just weren't yeah they weren't so to answer our next question that if you get a default judgment, it will be considered with prejudice. Oh, so yeah, so with prejudice means on the merits, without prejudice means you can still bring it again. Exactly, for claim preclusion or for, you know, some that nature. So if, when clerks if, instead of judges issue default judgments? On the default, or, or if the, uh, um, for the default, they can do that. But if the uh, if the defendant doesn't say anything, then can they also do it on the on the on the um, def not default the other one on um, default judgment itself? The key point here is when it's some certain, right? Yeah. So if it's like a con breach of contract and the contract has like a uh, what is it liquidated damages clause, like you will owe me a hundred thousand dollars if 
you breach the contract. That's a some certain. It doesn't like need to be really like, it's not like tort damages where that has to be like calculated. Like this, you already know. So the clerk can do it instead of the judge. Um, right. Um, um, yeah, I think within 14 days of the latest um, pleading or like motion or action. Okay, when can a party bring a request for a jury trial? I do think it's 14 days. Within 14 days of like the latest action in the trial. Uh, I don't know that's what you guys were answering when you're talking about 14 days. What kinds of issues can be tried by a jury versus those that must be tried by a judge? Jury would have to be um, issues of fact and judge would do issues of law. Yeah. So in anything involving like monetary damages, that would go to a jury. If it's questions like if you want an injunction, that will go to a judge because juries, they probably won't know what an injunction is or how to cap or how to do that. But what they do know is deciding how much someone might be owed after being punched in the face. So uh, and the last but certainly not least, what happens when the jury disobeys or misunderstands jury instruction? Generally a new trial. Generally a new ethnic trial. All right, I know, yeah, they, I'm, I'm with you too, uh, Paul. I know this was definitely the hardest, most difficult, I'll be honest. Um, oh, Barbara saying, or mistrial, so generally a new trial, maybe a mistrial, perhaps a mistrial. Yeah, well, a mistrial, which I guess result in a new trial. Yep. Um, look, I did the evidence one, which is really, really difficult as well. So, you know, tomorrow afternoon might be similar. We're going to take take a 15 come back at 640 and then we'll spend 30 minutes so we'll go you know to 710 looking over two essays and uh it'll be a wrap i really appreciate everyone for taking the time i hope you learned from this i actually learned a lot matt i definitely confirmed you are who you say you are master of everything and uh i think i grew like three years in that in that presentation but it was really awesome so thank you everyone for joining us